Next, um, I am pleased to uh, present our guest presenters from Google, uh, Julie Catio, Lissy Lillianfield, and Pen Pen Jang. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we have a few slides to present. So let me attempt to present my screen. Okay, um, can someone give me a thumbs up that you can see the slide? Yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, great, so yeah, on the call we have uh, several people from the Google team. So my name is Julie, uh, I'm a product manager in Google Research. We also have Pan Pan, Lisi, and, and Bob. And uh, we've been collaborating with ALS TDI for uh, the past three years on a project that we called Project Euphonia. And um, if you were at the ALS TDI Summit two years ago, we also gave an update back then. Um, and today I want to share, um, uh, we'll give an update on the progress on our data collection program. And we'll also tell you about two communication tools that uh, we've been building. Um, okay, so let's get started. So one of the problems that we are trying to address with this project is that speech recognition technology, which is currently being used in assistive tools such as the Google Assistant or Google Home or Alexa, Siri, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so that technology doesn't work uh, always very well uh, today for people whose speech uh, has been impacted by a condition. So for example, of course, uh, ALS, but it can also be true for people who have other conditions. Uh, for example, the person you can see on this slide is a research scientist at Google who has been deaf since he was one year old. So because he's Russian, he actually never heard himself speak English. And so his, uh, his speech is quite difficult to, to understand, uh, and for, for, for to, sorry, did someone ask a question? Oh, no. Okay. Sorry. I was, uh, I thought I heard someone. Um, so yeah, so for Dimitri, uh, who is pictured on, on this photograph, speech recognition doesn't work well today. And, uh, this is the problem that we are trying to address with, uh, with our project. So. A couple of years ago, we, we gave quite an extensive overview of what uh, machine learning and AI is uh, and what it means. I thought I would not go into too much details today, but I, I will give a kind of one minute overview of uh, what this means. Um, so speech recognition technology relies on uh, machine learning techniques. And um, in a nutshell, basically machine learning allows us to teach <laughs> Okay, sorry, I, hope, I don't know if I made this sound. <laughs> Hopefully this is over. Okay, sounds like you can hear me now. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so the way speech recognition works is we can teach a computer to do one task, but it requires some examples uh, so that we can show examples to the algorithm and let it learn from those examples. So one very classic uh, type of algorithm is uh, image recognition. So for example, if you would like to distinguish cats from dogs on photographs, um, what you will need in order to do that are pictures of cats and pictures of dogs and actually have labels associated with those pictures. And then um, we train a machine learning model to, to better recognize cats from dogs. And actually speech recognition doesn't work too differently. Um, we take as training data speech samples that have been recorded by people together with the transcription of this audio. Um, then we create what we call a um, spectrogram image, which is essentially a visual representation of the sound uh, over time and frequency. And then we train the computer to automatically recognize the, the sound so that you, know, you can do, for example, real-time transcription of speech. Um, so 
of course, the, one of the main reasons why speech recognition today doesn't work for someone who has um, a condition such as ALS or that or someone who is deaf is because the algorithm has not seen a lot of examples of what um, those you know people sound like essentially the the computer has only seen a lot of examples of uh, of other people with a more typical speech and so we uh, we first joined forces with ALS TDI in 2018 and um, a lot of people from the precision medicine program uh, actually recorded speech samples for the benefit of our research. And that was really the beginning of the project. Um, and so after that, we moved to a more broader crowdsourced data collection program in 2019. Uh, you can see the photo on the left is um, Sundar Pichai, who is the CEO of Google, who announced Project Euphonia to the world uh, that year. And um, that was the, the beginning of our research effort, uh, but it, it really all started uh, with the help of LSTDI. Um, so now Panpan Pan will tell you a little bit more about our data collection program and the progress that we've made uh, since we last uh, gave an update in this forum. And then Lisi and I will give some insights into the products that uh, we've been building. Um, so Panpan, Pan, I'll let you present the, the slide. All right, thanks, Julie. So um, my name is Pan Pan, and you might have actually gotten emails from me. Um, some of you have been involved in the data collection program. It's great to see so many of your faces here. Um, so as Julie mentioned, we kicked off our data collection program a few years ago, and we used this program called Chit Chat. Um, uh, next, next slide, please. And the phrases that we asked participants to record uh, had to do with some of the most important use cases that we wanted to cover, including um, home automation, like turning off the lights, um, speaking to uh, someone, uh, speaking to interact with your phone. With your phone. So this is um, called voice access and you can use your voice to actually do things on your phone without having to touch it. Uh, then there's talking to somebody who's taking care of you like um, I want to go to bed or I need to move and then having more free form conversations with other with others like uh, that food will never go bad. It's just a kind of conversational phrases that are a little bit longer. Uh, next. Next slide please. And I wanted to show you some progress that we have um, to date. So as you can see, our data collection efforts kicked off in 2018. And so now about three years later, we have more than a million recordings from more than a thousand different people. And that translates into more than a thousand hours of data. And we have data from all sorts of speakers, um, there are people with ALS, people with cerebral palsy, people with Down syndrome. Uh, so we try to have a diversity of data in our data set. But um, ALS is still our uh, most prominent category of uh, participants. Next slide, please. So you can see here, this is actually um, Bob McDonald, uh, first authored a paper that came out in Interspeech this year on our data collection efforts and where we're at. This is a table in that paper that shows the distribution of data that we have. And you can see that in terms of etiology, ALS is our uh, first category, meaning that we have almost 30% of our data coming from ALS participants. And then it's Down syndrome followed by Parkinson's disease. So in total, we have uh, more than 579 participants who've recorded more than 300 phrases. And 300 is a nice cutoff where we find that amount of data is quite useful to us. And uh, we have more male than female participants. And um, we also cover a number of etiologies, a number of speech, and a number of speech disorders. And the people that we gather data from fall into a spectrum of severities ranging from mild to profound. Um, yes, and Bob is saying that this data is helping us train our speech recognizers because as, 
As Julie mentioned, all of the data that we're collecting is used by our machine learning tools to try to create better automatic speech recognition models for atypical speech. Next slide, please. Okay, and here's another um, graph from that paper. And it just, th this is kind of the takeaway from the paper. If you look at this graph here, it shows you um, the word error rate, the W-E-R. And that just means how many words on average a automatic speech recognition model might be getting wrong. And so the lower it is, the better it is. And in green here are the word error rates for um, our participant pool when there's been no adaptation, like as if there was no training on any of the data. And you can see that they are fairly high, especially for this severe category. And that once we add the data that, that uh, you and others have contributed, that, wor that word error rate decreases by quite a lot, sometimes by over 75%. And um, at the end, more than 80% of the personalized models or the models that saw the data got trained data, achieved word error rates below 15%, which we find uh, use the 15% cutoff is uh, what we consider pretty useful for things like home automation. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this week, we actually updated our website to include all of our publications. You can go and see them at g.co slash euphonia. Um, you'll see all our blog posts, all our publications. And, and this is just, um, I also wanted to remind everyone that our data collection program is still ongoing. Thanks to everyone who's already contributed. There are um, dozens and dozens of you who have contributed data to our data collection program. And for those of you who haven't, you can still contribute to this basic research as we continue to make speech recognition models work better by going to g.co slash euphonia and signing our interest form. All right, and now back to Julie. Thanks, Pan Pan. Um, so as Pan Pan mentioned, we recorded, all of you actually, and, and many more people recorded over a million speech samples. And this has allowed us to uh, figure out how to personalize the speech recognition technology for individuals. Um, but that's not the only way that the um, people from the ALS TDI Precision Medicine pro um, Program helped us. Uh, we also worked with a number of uh, what we like to call trusted testers who, uh, for whom we created those fully personalized speech recognition models and helped us test them and give us feedback both about the accuracy of the speech recognition, but also about uh, what would be helpful tools and experiences that we could build for them. Uh, so one of them is uh, Andrea Pete, who you can see on this uh, photograph. And um, I'm actually going to play a short video clip of our very first uh, prototype, which we built a few years ago. And um, just to give you a little context for what you can see here. So Andrea is speaking to me on the video and you'll see a mobile phone which transcribes in real time everything she's saying. And the underlying technology that is doing those transcriptions are fully personalized to Andrea uh, because of the speech samples that she has recorded. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and then I'll play the, the video. So Andrea, what are you going to do for Christmas? Uh, for Christmas, we are going to Philadelphia where my in-laws live and my parents will be coming with us. Sounds yeah. good. <laughs> Uh, is it cold in Philadelphia in December? It's always cold. And I sit on the couch in front of the fire for five days. Nice. Okay, so I hope you could uh, see that. Uh, hopefully it was not too small. Um, so this was the, the first prototype that we, we worked on with the help of Andrea and all the people who contributed speech samples to the program. 
Um, and uh, over the past year, we've actually been busy building a mobile app that we could actually launch and allow people to use. Um, so we've created an app that we call the Project Relate. And uh, it's designed to learn to understand someone's unique speech pattern. Um, so it's an Android app. It's, uh, we're actually announcing on Tuesday next week uh, that we're opening up our trusted tester program a little bit more broadly in the US and Canada. And so people who have um, whose speech is impacted by a condition can download the app. And then they are asked to record prompted speech samples so you can see on the right an example of card with a sentence. And so the goal is to, to record it. And then once the recordings are done, the app basically automatically trains itself to recognize the speech of the user who has done the recordings. And then um, three features become available. The first one is called listen. It looks like what you just saw Andrea using. Uh, so it transcribes everything in real time. It can be used to copy paste into messages or uh, to close caption a presentation, for example. We also have a feature called repeat, which um, repeats after you in a clear computerized voice. And the final one is assistant, and it um, basically allows you to ask questions to the Google Assistant if you have some smart light bulbs or thermostat at home, which Andrea does. You can do things such as turning the lights on and off or changing the temperature, or just ask some questions about the weather or things like that uh, to Google. Um, to give you a, a better idea about the app, I will now play um, our video, which actually is still a um, work in progress because we're going to publish it on Tuesday, uh, upload it to YouTube. So for now, it's, it's still a, a working version of the video, but I thought it would, be, um, it would be nice for everyone to watch it. So I'll mute myself and we'll watch this video. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understand this one. This is a fundamental human need. And I think it's also a basic human right. I'm Audrey Lee, I'm planning here at Google. More specifically, I'm a namer. And it's a lot of fun to say that I'm a professional namer. I had a type of muscular history that affects the way I speak. I have always loved making new friends, but when people can't understand me at first, they had trouble getting to know me. It's as if there's an invisible barrier between us. I believe technology can help bring down that barrier. My name is Julie Cantu. I'm a product manager at Google in the research team. Project Relate started in 2018 when we realized that our speech recognition technology could be improved to help people with speech impairments be better understood. Standard speech recognition doesn't always work as well for people with atypical speech because the algorithms have not been trained on samples of their speech. So we decided to create an app that would be custom trained on individuals' unique speech patterns. We named the app Relate because of what it enables you to do. To use the app, the first step is to record a set of phrases so it can get to know how you speak. The Relate app has three built-in features, listen, repeat, and assistant. Listen transcribes everything you're saying in real time. So I have a custom voice model now. And repeat, repeat what you've just said in a clear computerized voice. Next thing I hot chocolate. Hot chocolate. Ah, uh, gotcha. Thank you. Assistant connects directly with your Google Assistant. Take a selfie. Okay. Get ready. I hope I live to see the day when disabled people can move from the world and accept the same level of connection as everyone else has. I think Project Relate is bringing us closer to a better future. Okay, I hope you could uh, you could see and hear the video correctly. Um, so last, I just wanted to thank uh, everyone who has helped us uh, either by recording speech samples for the Euphonia program or who have been testing the Relate app over the past few months. 
all your helpful uh, uh, feedback has been heard. And uh, we're opening up the program more broadly on Tuesday. Uh, so if you or someone you know might be interested in trying out uh, the app, uh, there's an interest form where you can express interest, uh, which is available at g.co for slash project relate. Um, so yeah, don't hesitate to, to ask us any questions about the app if you're interested. Um, okay, and now Lisi, who is also on the call, is going Lisi is going now to talk about Project Activate. Hi, I'm Lisi. Uh, I'm so delighted to be here. I joined Project Euphonia two years ago, and my first uh, my first team event, like one of the first things that I did when joining the team was to meet everyone at the ALS TDI White Coat Affair. And so it's it's wild to be uh, back here two years later, uh, albeit in virtual form. Um, that was really like my first my first step into the world of ALS. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to be here and excited to be bringing you uh, an update. Julie, could you bring the next slide? Great, so as Julie mentioned, what Project Euphonia really is driving towards is helping people with atypical speech be better understood. And all the work that Julie's been talking about uh, focuses on understanding dysarthric speech. Through doing that work and through working with people with ALS, we came to understand that there was an additional need here that a lot of the people that we were working with who had ALS, they had dysarthric speech, at some point, as the condition progressed, they eventually lost the ability to be able to speak. And so we asked ourselves, what can we do for people who no longer are able to speak? Next slide. So we talked with um, people with ALS, people who, are, who use alternative and augmentative communication devices. We talked to speech language pathologists and we tried to understand what are the challenges with these AACs, with these communication devices as they stand right now. And some of the things that we heard were that these devices can be unreliable, that they're also very expensive. And so they're so expensive, you can't have a second one. So then the device becomes a single point of failure. Also, we heard that these devices are cumbersome, so they're hard to relocate, they're finicky to calibrate, that people were having a lot of challenges, and that the devices were sometimes too slow, and so people were feeling like that they were missing out on the moment. Next slide. And click again. So just to bring these problems, bring these challenges a little bit more to life, let me tell you about some of the folks that we worked with. One person, we'll call her Alice. Um, she is brilliant and clever and she she's quadriplegic and she also has um, paralysis of her vocal cords to some degree. And so she can speak, but her speech is very soft. And she told us that when she needs attention, right? If she, she said, if she needs repositioning, if she's thirsty, if her communication device is frozen, she would try to call out and sometimes a family member would hear her, but sometimes not. And then she would just wait and wait and wait. So maybe you know somebody who's in a position like Alice. Next. Another person that we worked with, we'll call him Bruno. He's a tech whiz, uh, he has ALS. And he said that one night uh, his caregiver, he had a new caregiver was putting him to bed and she left his head tipped too far back. So this was a very uncomfortable position for him. He tried to get her attention as she was walking out the door, but the head position meant that his head mouse had lost calibration. And so he wasn't able to communicate with her. And he actually was stuck like that for six and a half hours until the next caregiver came in. So maybe you know someone who's been in a position like Bruno. Next. And the third person I'll tell you about, we'll call him Chad. He's a huge personality. He's, he's, he's artistic and sarcastic. Um, and, and he said that sometimes using his communication device, it's too slow and he just feels invisible. He feels like he's missing out on the moment. So maybe you know someone who feels kind of like Chad. Next slide. And so we took all of this and we designed an Android app called Project Activate. This is not a replacement for a communication device, 
for like a like a full communication device, but rather it's a quick, portable, easy to use Android app specifically designed for those spontaneous in the moment communications. And so we, right because it runs on an Android phone, Android phones are quite affordable compared to um, co a lot of these communication devices and a lot of other assistive technology, right? And the app itself is free. It's portable, it's a lot smaller. Um, and we made the app really, really streamlined. So the way that the app works is it supports, uh, it, it detects face gestures and you can have these gestures mapped to activate preset actions. So uh, for so what, let, the gestures that are supported are smile, open mouth, raise eyebrows and looking in different directions. And then you can use any of those to activate any of these preset actions. And so we can see on the next slide what this looks like. So for example, uh, I can set up the app so that when I raise my eyebrows, my phone will speak, wait, right? That's what Bruno could have used in that moment before the caregiver walked out the door. Um, something that, that uh, Alice might use, right? Is smile to send a text message to her family to say, please come here. Um, or maybe I wanna set the app so that when I look up twice, uh, it plays the phrase, check my AAC, just so that somebody knows that I don't have access to my regular communication device right now. And so we focused on kind of two, two main scenarios. One is the getting attention, as I just described, but then the other one is self-expression. And we really heard from, from the people that we worked with that it wasn't enough to just be able to kind of get the basics met, but that they really wanted to be able to feel like themselves in the moment. And so one thing that, that Bruno told us early on is that when he's watching the game with friends, he wants to be able to cheer along with everyone else. And so another thing that you might do with the app is to set it so that when you open your mouth, it plays a cheer. Next slide. And so the way that this works, um, the, the technology that, that enables this face gesture detection um, is that it uses the phone's front-facing camera and machine learning to understand your facial gestures. And these gesture, the gesture detection is customizable. So you can set the sensitivity and the timing to accommodate people with a wide variety of abilities of uh, ability to move their face. So if somebody has very little motion, you can make it very sensitive. If somebody has bigger motions, then you can make it less sensitive so that it will only uh, activate when they make a big deliberate movement. And we also have a repeat to confirm feature so that if you wanna make sure that it's only going off when you're doing it really on purpose, right? You can have it so that it only, it only activates after you've done the gesture twice. Um, and I'll just make one comment on privacy here, which is that the images are never saved or sent anywhere. This all runs on the device. Next. Yeah, so we, uh, we launched this app just uh, about six weeks ago. And uh, after we launched, Alice posted on Facebook about her experience using this app. Um, she said, I want to share with you an amazing app by Google that can be very helpful for people with speech and motor disabilities. I've used it for a few months and it completely changed my life. She told us that now, whenever she needs a drink or she needs to be repositioned or her computer, her computer isn't working, she doesn't have to wait. She just opens her mouth and it sends a text and somebody comes right away. So it's been really heartening and exciting to uh, hear how transformational this app has been for her. And, and maybe, you know, maybe you know somebody like her who could also uh, benefit from this app as well. As I said, we launched fairly recently and so we're still uh, trying to get the word out to the right people so that um, more people who need it can uh, can benefit from this app. So so uh, next slide, please. Um, I'd love for you to check out the app. Uh, you can try it at g.co slash project activate. And if you know anybody uh, who needs it, definitely send them to that link as well. Um, and if you want to reach out, you can always contact me at project activate at google.com. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lissy. So these are all the slides we had today. Thank you so much for, for listening to this update. And uh, I see that Bob already answered some questions in the chat. But if you have any other question that you would like to ask, I uh, would be happy to, to answer any questions.
All right. Um, let's see, I think there was one question in the chat that didn't get answered, uh, which was uh, when you're collecting this data, do you still need um, maybe non-ALS controls or just people who uh, don't have challenges with speech? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, no, actually, we're not uh, collecting this type of uh, data at the moment because we, we already have enough of it. But thank you for, for um, offering your help. Uh, so yeah, at the moment, uh, we're really more focused on people whose speech has been affected. Um, yeah, thanks for asking, though. And uh, are, are there any plans uh, to make this available on Apple devices in the future? Yeah, good question. Um, so I'll let Lisi respond for the Activate app, but for Relate, we're starting with Android first and trying to build something uh, that we're happy with and that uh, you know is actually uh, being helpful. And then once we're happy with our app, we hope to bring it to iOS as well. But it's not the case today. We don't yet have a, an iOS uh, app. Um, yeah, good question. Yeah, and likewise, uh, we are we're not uh, building on iOS at this time. All right. Uh, last call for questions. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you uh, very much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> and we we did have one last question that came in. Uh, is the uh, Project Relate video publicly available? Oh, yeah, uh, that's also a good question. So you are actually the first to, to watch it. <laughs> it's not public yet. But on Tuesday, we are publishing a blog post to announce uh, that we are opening up the Trusted Tester program a little bit more broadly. So the video will be in the blog. Uh, so watch out for uh, um, an article on, on Tuesday. But until then, unfortunately, it's not public yet. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we can send uh, an email on Tuesday with the video. Yeah, you got a, the sneak uh, preview. It's not final yet. <laughs> and uh, one other question that's come in. Uh, are you also collaborating with researchers who are trying to use voice to detect even smaller changes in vital capacity? Yeah, Bob, I wonder if you want to comment on that. Uh, Michael's work might be, you know, relevant to that. Yeah, uh, in fact, that it really does kind of bring us full circle. Uh, as I think Fernando mentioned uh, earlier on in the program, uh, we got connected with each other through a research effort uh, tied to this kind of idea of using uh, the subtleties of someone's speech pattern that a human might not be able to pick up, but uh, that might be indicative of uh, small changes um, through disease progression. And um, we give a pretty extensive talk a year ago, or two years ago, I guess, with COVID, it's, you know, things have just, time has gotten warped. But uh, yeah, that remains an area of active interest in the community and uh, the wealth of data that uh, you know, the ALS TDI community has provided, uh, along with the data that uh, ALS TDI collects from from their trials and, and studies, uh, is really the you know the key to detecting those kinds of subtle changes. Um, so so yes, that's that's still an active area of of research, but it's a longer term program, and we're happy to show some short term payback through these two apps and hopefully people you know, will take advantage of that soon. Okay, now, uh, now I think uh, for real this time, uh, that's all the questions, but uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.